Hello everybody, I am Chad Kaimani Jackson and I'm the District Archaeologist for the San Luis Obispo Coast District of California State Parks. That's me. Now our district runs from San Luis Obispo north along the coast to just below the Monterey County line. And my job is I work with local Native American groups, I work with other state park staff and the public to help manage the archaeological sites and the many cultural and historic resources that state parks has under their care. Now today, I'm gonna to be talking about arrowheads, or what archeologists refer to as projectile points. Now the thought of arrowheads stirs up many different feelings for different people. I want you to think for a moment, what sort of thoughts or feelings come to your mind when you think of arrowheads? Now here in the United States, the thought of arrowheads may stir up notions of Native American life, memories of camping trips, grandpa's arrowhead collection, or may remind us of our own ancestral past. Now let's get our terminology straight. Archaeologists refer to arrowheads as projectile points because they're not always used as arrows, but they are used as projectiles or objects that fly through the air at a specific target. Now archaeologists consider projectile points to be very important artifacts that can tell us a lot about an archaeological site and about what was happening in the distant past at that location. Archaeologists consider projectile points to be valuable pieces of the archaeological record, and when found in an archaeological context, are taken and studied in laboratories in order to see how old they are, what was being hunted, hunting strategies, trade with other groups, and many, many other things about that archaeological site. This is one of the reasons why it's very important not to take or collect artifacts and projectile points that you may find in national and state parks. Now when I say the archaeological record, I'm referring to the total sum of the physical remains of human activity that are found across the landscape and buried in the ground. Now just to blow your mind for a moment, the archaeological record of certain places of Africa goes back over a million years. Paleoanthropologists are discovering stone tools and fossilized remains of our human ancestors that goes back that far. And even older and more amazing things are being found and yet to be discovered. Now I want you to think for a second, how did our human ancestors get to where they were back then to where we are today? I mean, look at our technology. We have computers, we have cars, airplanes, satellites, archeologists are dealing with some of the most basic, simple technologies that humans were using back in the day. And projectile points were one of the most important tools that humans had to survive. Now here on the central coast of California, the archeological record goes back over 12,000 years, some of the oldest in all of the Americas. The great archeologist Roberta Greenwood conducted one of the first archaeological investigations just a few miles south from here at Morro Bay State Park in 1968. And this was before environmental laws were put in place to help protect archaeological sites and what now fuels much of the archaeological research that happens today in California. In her study, she found over 9,000 years of human occupation at one site. Since then, archaeologists in California have placed projectile points into many different types, styles, and time periods. So when an archaeologist finds a projectile point, one of the first things they do is try to see what type it is in order to place it into one of those time periods. Now we know that some of the oldest projectile points in the Americas were used to hunt the large game, such as woolly mammoths. Now these points are typically referred to as Folsom or Clovis points. And when the woolly mammoth and other large late Pleistocene fauna went extinct about 10,000 years ago, those Projectile point styles disappeared in the archaeological record, so we know that they were no longer used. Now here in Central California, what are some of the different projectile point types that we have? Well, some of those earliest projectile point styles were large spears used to hunt big game. One of the projectile point styles in that time period were called large side notch points. Here I have the base of one of those points, and you can see the side notches that were used to tie projectile point to the shaft. Now I can put two pieces together here so you can visualize what one of these would look like. 
Now these play styles date to about 10,000 years ago up to about 5,000 years ago in general. After that early period, the California Native Americans began using the spear thrower or the addle addle. This is a Mesoamerican term that comes from the Aztec language Nahuatl. Now the spear thrower is similar to a dog thrower. You know the dog thrower where you put the tennis ball in it and you chuck it? That's essentially how the addle addle works. So most of the projectile points that are found in California in archaeological sites were used with the addle addle. We sometimes refer to them as dart points. There's many different types, many different sizes, from many different regions. Here in the Central Coast, the most common type is referred to as the contracting stemmed type. Now here we have a couple of the contracting stem types. This is a somewhat large one. And you can see the stem, the piece that is put onto the shaft, tapers. That's where the contracting stem term comes from. Here's another one. You can see that stem is contracting. This is fastened to the shaft with asphaltum or tar. The local Shumash term for this was called Pismu. And this is the same tar that we find on the beaches. And the town of Pismo Beach derives its name from that Shumash term. Now, these points were used roughly from 5,000 years ago up to about 1,000 years ago when the bow and arrow technology replaced it. Bow and arrow technology was introduced into the Central California coast around 1,000 years ago from the interior. Bow and arrow technology was a great advantage for hunting. Not only could you hunt your prey from further away, but also with much more accuracy. Now we know that bow and arrow technology was not used on the coast of California until about a thousand years ago, because we do not find any bow and arrow style projectile points in the archeological record prior to about a thousand years ago. Bow and arrow style projectile points are much smaller and thinner than out of auto projectile points. And some of those points are referred to as bird points but because they are thought to have been used to hunt birds. But in fact, they were used to hunt deer and other large game. The increased speed that you get from bow and arrow technology allows the point to travel further with more accuracy and precision and penetrate tough hide. There are many different styles of bow and arrow projectile points here on the coast of Central California. One of them is called the desert side notch point. You can see how small it is. This point is very thin and it has two side notches where sinew was used to haft it to a straight shaft usually made from willow or toyon sticks. Now this point is more of a leaf shaped which was hafted to a shaft usually with the pismo. Now here on the central coast of California, there is no obsidian. Obsidian is the best material for making projectile points because it can be made into the sharpest of edges. In fact, today, surgeons use obsidian because it can be made even sharper than metal. Now there was obsidian on the central coast, but it was acquired through trade from the groups that lived in the Sierra Nevadas or other interior places where those obsidian sources were located. The vast majority of projectile points found here on the central coast of California was made from local stone called chert. Now chert forms in a rather remarkable way. Microscopic zooplankton construct their shells from silica or quartz. And when millions of these die, their shells float down to the bottom of the seafloor where they accumulate in what is called the silicious ooze. Now, after time, the silicious ooze is buried and then compressed and turned into rock. Later, landforms are uplifted and that chert is exposed into rock formations and it can be harvested by people to make tools. We have primarily two different types of chert found here on the central coast of California. We have Monterey chert, which is typically black pink, red, brown, or gray, and it is somewhat see-through or translucent. The second type is called Franciscan chert, and it is typically brown, blue, green, or white, and it is not see-through or it's opaque. The Franciscan chert forms from a much older rock formation that was created from high pressure from the colliding of two plates of the Earth's crust.
pretty crazy story. Now, when I say flake stone, this refers to the way the tools were made. Flaking or napping is a process of removing pieces from centralized core. Archaeologists find these discarded pieces that we call flakes, and they're scattered across a landscape from Native Americans making tools for many thousands of years. There are a variety of ways of making a good flake stone tool. There is percussion, which is when you strike the stone with a blunt object to remove pieces. And there is pressure flaking, which is when you take a tool and you press it along the edge of the stone to remove pieces. And there's also hammer and anvil. And that is when you place an anvil on the stone and use a hammer to punch off pieces. Now, different types of flakes are produced from these different techniques. And we know when we find a flake by studying it, which type of technique was used. If you were to make your own point, you might utilize a variety of different ways to come up with your finished product. Now, I want you to imagine, if you were a Native American, what type of point would you make and how would you make it? Now, I'm gonna show you how I would make a point. I would probably get some obsidian, since it's the best. I would take some leather to protect my hand, and I would use an antler for my pressure flaking tool. Now, I would take my blank, or my piece I'm gonna make my tool out of, and I would begin working the edges and get a nice general shape, maybe sort of a shape of a football. Then I would continue to work the piece and thin it out to create somewhat of a biface, which is basically something that's been worked on both faces of the stone. Now I'm going to take my piece of obsidian, hold it on the leather, and I'll press it on my leg, I'm going to remove a flake that comes off from the opposite side. Now I'll continue to do this all the way around the tool. Now, I'm not very good at this, but you get the point. Now, if you're gonna make your own projectile point at home, I want you to take safety precautions. Don't forget to wear gloves, use leather to protect yourself, and wear some protective eyewear. It's also good to wear shoes, because when you have a bunch of sharp flakes lying on the ground, you're likely to cut your feet. Well, thank you for listening today. And I encourage you to go out, enjoy the great outdoors. And the next time you're out hiking, I want you to look out across the landscape. And when your stomach starts to rumble, I want you to imagine being a Native American 5,000 years ago. What would you need to do in order to bring home dinner for your family? What would you hunt? A deer, a rabbit, a duck? What type of point would you make? What would you use to shoot the animal? A bow and arrow, an adol adol? Or would you make a throwing spear? And once we start thinking about these things, we realize it wasn't easy. We also have to remember that Native American people consider these artifacts part of their heritage. And our job is to help manage and conserve as much as we can in the landscape so everybody can enjoy it. We'll see you next time.